Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us today for this month's Preservation Book Club program. My name is Katie Peace. I'm the Director of Communications for the Preservation League of New York State. If you've made your way to this webinar but are not familiar with the League, we are a New York statewide nonprofit focused on investing in people and projects that champion the essential role of preservation in community revitalization, sustainable economic growth, and the protection of our historic buildings and landscapes. We do this in many different ways from technical services to grants, our seven to save list of endangered historic sites, our excellence in historic preservation awards, public policy and advocacy that we do at the local, state and federal levels, and a whole bunch of online programs, including this one um, and ones like it that are sponsored by the Peggy and Roger G. Gary Charitable Trust. So thank you to our sponsors. Um, I do want to go over a few housekeeping notes. So for today's program, we are happy to offer continuing education credits through um, the New York State Education Department. If you would like to claim continuing education credits, please email me or DM me in the chat and we will get that all squared away for you. Um, so today we are joined by Christina Wilson. She is a professor of art history at Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts, and she is the author of Mid-Century Modernism and the American Body. The poli uh, race, gender, and the politics of power in design, which is what we are here to talk about today. She's written several other award-winning award -winning books, including The Modern Eye, Stieglitz, MoMA, and The Art of the Exhibition, and Livable Modernism, Interior Decorating and Design During the Great Depression. So we're very excited to have Christina here to talk about mid-century modernism and the American body. Um, this book provides a striking counter-narrative to conventional histories of design. Mid-century modernism and the American body unveils fresh perspectives on one of the most distinctive movements in American visual culture. Um, Mid-century modern design is ubiquitous and it's something that I think a lot of people think that they know, but Christina has taken a really interesting critical look at that design vocabulary and how it functioned historically and how it functions today. So we're really excited to get into this book. Um, following Christina's presentation today, we will be joined by Sarah T.G. Meets, who will be moderating the conversation. Uh, Sarah was formerly the director of Dorothy Easter's Hilltop House and Studio in Casanova, New York. She's currently the digital content editor at the Haystack Mountain School of Crafts. Uh, she is a preservationist and historian and artist and I think a perfect person to moderate today's conversation with Christina, so we're very excited to have her here. Um, if you have questions during Christina's presentation, please drop them in the Q&A box. Sarah will incorporate as many audience questions as possible after Christina's presentation. And if you have any general comments, you can feel free to drop those in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat to share links and things like that. Um, and with that, I am going to turn things over to Christina. Christina, I think you're on mute. Oh boy, that is a rookie Zoom mistake. Um, it's nice to be not so familiar with Zoom anymore. Um, so thank you, Katie, for that nice introduction. And um, I'm looking forward to the conversation with Sarah and with all of you afterwards. And thank you all of you for showing up this afternoon. Um, okay, let's see, I'm going to um, share my screen and get us into the um, into the um, PowerPoint, which I hope you all can see now. And um, what I'd like to do this afternoon, I'm showing you the cover of my book and then the uh, the sort of the title pages of each of the four main chapters. And what I wanted to do this afternoon is um, offer you some thoughts about how I came to this book project and introduce some of the key issues and questions that I pursue in it. Uh, the book came out in the spring of 2021, which I was a little alarmed this morning to realize is now almost two years ago. Uh, however, I had been researching and working on this book for most of the decade prior to that, uh, which, you know, in the world, that's the way things roll in the world of academia. Um, you sort of sit on things for a long time and they kind of percolate in your brain and the project grows. So this is something I had been living with for almost 10 years uh, by the time it came out. 
Um, and so what I'd like to do this afternoon is, like I said, sort of talk about some of the big questions and major themes that I was wrestling with in the book. And I'm going to do this by engaging with some of the material in three of these chapters, chapters one, two, and three. Although, as I realized, I'm actually not gonna talk about them in that order. And I'll explain to you why in just a little bit. Um, so, but I wanted to start off by just talking a little bit about what it means to me to think of my work as design history and what I mean when I say I'm a design historian. Uh, when I talk about myself as a design historian, one of the things I'm always thinking about is about how design is a tool for self-fashioning and really uh, a, one of the ways that we present ourselves to our peers, to our community, and to the world. Um, so it's a tool of self-fashioning. It's a tool of self-presentation. It's also a tool of power. And that's something that I'm also very interested in. Uh, one of the things that I was thinking about a lot as I started work on this book is basic questions of, um, that are related to power. Whose bodies are allowed to be comfortable in a design object? Whose bodies are put on display when they sit on a design object? Whose bodies are allowed to be seen at all in certain designs? These are the kinds of questions I was asking. When I began working on this project, I wanted to think about how the objects that we commonly kind of refer to as mid-century modernism, I wanted to think about how they might be involved in mid-century discourses of power around race and gender. The standard story of mid-century modernism is that it was finally the moment when modern design became popular for everyone because designers like Charles and Ray Eames achieved elegant designs that could be mass produced and designs like the butterfly chair, which you're seeing in the lower right corner here, suddenly became ubiquitous because they were relentlessly knocked off. Uh, this is a glossy story, however, that overlooks some messy realities. It assumes, for example, that affordability is the only thing that matters, as if people don't occasionally buy expensive items as a long-term investment. This story also prioritizes aesthetics and thinks less about actual physical bodily comfort. And when I think about bodily comfort, and I'm looking at these images here, I look, for example, at this small child, which I hope you can see on your screen, who's kind of hunched forward in the butterfly chair and does not look particularly comfortable. Or, you know, just to go back to the cover of my book, the butterfly chair was apparently so comfortable that they decided to take it apart entirely. And the model is simply striding through the frame of the chair, basically leaving it in pieces. It's as if this conventional, this conventional history basically puts at its center the designers who had the industry networks to make mass production possible. And these were, at the time, predominantly white men. And so I began to think about the fact that the glossy story of mid-century modernism's triumph is very much a story that reinforces whiteness. And I wanted to delve into that. This book, the one that I ended up writing, is about that pursuit, about that question. I basically realized that I had not noticed some of the ways that mid-century modernist design operates to reinforce whiteness because I am a white scholar. The book is a layered account of how I approached the questions of race and gender in design. So in the book, I look at how modern design was marketed to audiences in the decades after World War II, but I also look at designers and practitioners of modernism, and I pay attention to how they talk about modernism. So for example, in chapter three, and this is where I'm beginning to sort of talk about the chapters not exactly in order, um, and I'm talking about it first because chapter three is actually the chapter that I researched first. And that's the chapter that I actually really, that brought me first into this project as a whole. That was the thing where I really, that's the chapter that I really kind of started with and from which the entire project grew. 
So in chapter three, I did a lot of research on the Herman Miller Furniture Company, which is a company that may be familiar to many of you. And their design director in the mid-century decades, uh, George Nelson. I was interested in how, as we can see on this slide, Nelson designed showrooms, which is an image we're seeing in the middle, catalog copy, and also advertising copy. And that in all three of these things, in the showrooms, in the catalogs, and in the advertising, he included selected, isolated objects from non-Western cultures, which were actually very often examples of tourist art as exotic curios. And so I'm showing you, so just to sort of draw your attention to these small objects, which can be hard to see in these photographs, uh, but there's a uh, there's a dress, a woman, a, a doll wearing a dress here uh, on the left-hand image. And then in this central photograph, we have some examples of Oaxacan um, objects uh, down here on the lower shelf. And then up top, some examples of Nayarut figurines. And then here um, is a, a, a mask from Bali um, in the upper part of this advertisement. Uh, these items were not for sale when they appear in this kind of material. And they set, rhetorically, they set up a binary um, in the company's publicity materials. And the binary goes like this. It's between folk culture on the one hand and industrial design production on the other hand. And another way to put this would be to say that these images set up a binary between on the one hand, crafted objects by people of color from all over the world that get lumped together into one non-distinct quote unquote other, as we can see in that middle image where all of those images are just kind of put together, all of those objects are put together, um, mishmash on the shelves next to each other. Um, and then on the, so all of that sort of folk culture by people of color is on one hand. And on the other hand, we have the rationality and whiteness of Nelson's own designs. So one of the things that I became interested in is how he deploys these exotic objects to basically throw into relief the rationality and whiteness of his own designs. I was also struck by the fact that many of Nelson's chairs are not actually that comfortable to sit in. Uh, Nelson himself described sitting in the coconut chair, which is the chair at the top of this slide. Um, he described sitting in it like this. He said, this chair needs practice and agility to sit in comfortably. We continue, however, to admire its elegance while making no mention of the fact that to enjoy the view, one naturally sits in something more comfortable. Hmm. It's not a ringing endorsement. Um, the marshmallow sofa is another good example of an uncomfortable seating object. And perhaps you have sat on one of these. Um, the 10 inch um, cushions are not really large enough for an adult derriere. Um, so you're always left straddling uncomfortably two of the cushions. Um, and I began to reflect on the fact that many of these modern seating items were often illustrated with women on them. So, for example, um, they're often photographed uh, from behind and the women are sort of presented as these sort of um, tantalizing half views um, sort of being seen kind of through the sort of image of the chair. Um, women are also photographed in the nude on some of these chairs. And the photograph we're looking at here is a photograph that accompanied an article by George Nelson from 1957. And that's actually the same article where he made the comment that his own coconut chair, which was is in the lower center of this photo, where he made the comment that the coconut chair is not a comfortable chair to sit in. So he was not responsible for this photograph. It was made by John Rawlings, but this photograph with a nude woman in Saarinen's womb chair, um, this photograph accompanied his article where he says that the coconut chair is not comfortable to sit in. And in fact, when Nelson wrote a book about chairs in 1953, 
He said that the new open floor plan of the mid-century suburban ranch house um, ne necessitated that chairs must now stand out with interesting curves, quote, like a girl in a bikini suit, unquote. And this photograph, the one that we're looking at here on the screen, was the opening image of the book. So the designs, the modernist designs that we're looking at here, these participated, what I'm suggesting is that they participate in a rhetoric of controlling women, white women, by putting them on view in uncomfortable chairs for women, sorry, for men to gaze at. That was a Freudian slip there. Um, so these are objects that put women on view for men, white women on view for men to gaze at. Now I turned to George Nelson as an author in chapter one as well, uh, where I examined five advice books on interior decorating and house design. Uh, and these books were all published, the five books that I examined were all published between 1945 and 1951. So these are basically books that were published in anticipation of the post-war housing boom. And I was interested in the voices of modernists, designers and architects. And I wanted to know how they talked about modernism and how they sold it to their reading public. There's a lot of judgment that is evident in all of these texts. Although some interesting themes do emerge, all of these authors describe the house as a place that governs the body, that exercises control over the body, and especially that exercises control um, over the labor of the women who reside in the house. Uh, all of these books presume an, a heteronormative household. There are um, several white authors that I discussed in this chapter, um, and they are Russell and Mary, Russell and Mary Wright. And so they are represented, their book is represented by these two images on the lower part of the screen, the color image in the lower right, and then this uh, sepia line image here in the center bottom. So that's Russell and Mary Wright. Uh, another book that I discussed is by Mary Brandt, and she is her book is represented by these two uh, drawings here of the fam of various family members. Uh, another book by another pair of white authors is by George Nelson and Henry Wright, and their book is represented by these two different the photograph and then the dining room drawing here in the center upper center part of my slide. Um, all of the white authors in this group all describe modernism as a style that you can choose as a reader that will distinguish you. So modernism is the style, a style that distinguishes the reader. They also emphasize that modernism is a style that really demands a special commitment. It's something that is a little bit extra hard something you need to work for. It's something that demands this extra special commitment. Paul Williams is the, uh, is the fifth author who I, or is the, is the other author that I write about. Um, and his book, his two books are the fourth and fifth books that I examined. And they are represented in these two images with the greenish tint on the outer right and left part of my screen. Paul Williams was the first African-American elected to the AIA, the American Institute of Architects. And he alone suggests that modernism can be understood as one style among many. It does not require a special commitment, um, but also he suggests that it's a style that might appeal to many. It's not something that is um, extra hard to attain. It's something that might appeal to a lot of people. His rhetoric, Williams's rhetoric is one of inclusivity as opposed to creating divisions. The strategy of creating divisions is the dominant strategy that the white authors use. Williams instead adopts a tone of inclusivity. And throughout his text, the reader repeatedly encounters language that connects modernism 
and interior design, modernism and interior design with freedom. How to design your home and its spaces to maximize freedom of movement. These are very different messages from those that we encounter when we're reading the white authors. Now, Paul Williams is only one voice, but in my book, I suggest that he might be connected to a larger counter narrative about modernism in the mid century United States. This is a counter narrative anchored around black voices and black lives that presents a set of values constellated around modernism that differs in really important ways from how white designers, architects, and advertisers valued modernism in these years. And I trace this counter narrative further in chapter two of the book, where I compare how modernism appears in Ebony Magazine and Life Magazine during the decades of the 1950s. Now, what I found when I compared these two sort of mass media publications is not that modernism is utterly distinct from one magazine to the next, but rather that the points of emphasis in each one are meaningfully different. There's more emphasis on control, cleanliness, and defensive exclusion in life's modernism. And that is represented in the three images that you're seeing on the left-hand side of the screen here. And all of these, or each of these, represent or, or feature modernist furniture. And you're seeing that in each, uh, each of the three of these, modernist furniture and cleaning supplies. And when you look closely at the images in each, three of the, uh, each of the three of these advertisements, they set up a dynamic where modernism, modern furniture is associated with the defense of a fragile whiteness against dirt and against the unknown regions beyond the plate glass windows. And we see plate glass windows or frosted plate glass windows in each one of these beyond the plate glass windows of the lily white suburbs. By contrast, there is much more emphasis on bodily comfort and economic agency in Ebony's modernism. And I'm giving you three images here, all three of these taken from advertisements on the right-hand side of the screen that are all taken from Ebony in the 1950s. And it's a repeating motif that we see time and again of models comfortably lounging in their modernist, lounging in and on their modernist furniture, acting as confident, gracious hosts. Modernism appears in more than just advertisements in these two magazines, of course. Um, so I was also, in addition, to in addition to advertising, I also looked at editorial content. Ebony and Life profiled designers, and those who created modernist works of art and architecture. And I was interested to note that similar tones and points of emphasis appear in these discussions as well. So Ad Bates is a furniture designer, was a furniture designer, and he's shown here in the upper left image on the screen. And he's shown in this article from 1951 at work in his studio sanding a large austere plane of wood that could perhaps become the, the top of something like this coffee table that we see um, in the lower image that he designed. And importantly, this coffee table, if you're looking at it closely and you see that the model is demonstrating putting her legs up on it, the coffee table that Bates designed actually comes with the cushions that you can put on the coffee table in order to put your feet up onto it. So this is not a misuse of the design. Rather, the design is takes into account how people live with and use their furniture. And so he designed it with these cushions um, so that you can put up onto the coffee table so that you can put your feet up on it. So this is one example of how modern design and a designer, a practitioner of modernism is presented in Ebony Magazine. And then contrast that with an article featuring Charles Eames, um, who I'm giving you two images here on the right-hand side of the screen. So Eames is shown 
perfectly static, literally like a statue with his hands in his pocket. He is not doing any planing or sanding of wood. The most we see him doing is delicately pinning some tumbleweed to a wall. Modernism is codified with signifiers of control, exclusion, and whiteness in life, but it becomes a tool of agency, bodily comfort, and social empowerment for African Americans in ebony. Ultimately, what I found in this material and what I argue in my book is that mid-century modernism was not always about whiteness. Its symbolic value varied considerably depending on the audience. And this means for us that its history and legacy have multiple strands and are quite complex. However, the history of mid-century modernism that has been most commonly told and that has come down to us in the 21st century is the history that is represented in these kinds of images here that I'm putting back up on the screen. It is a history that tends to prioritize white designers and to privilege concerns that erase bodily individuality. Modernism becomes about quote unquote clean lines that do not change with the impact of bodies sitting on them. Modernism becomes about industrial processes that safely subsume the material residue of the past. This is a version of modernism that is silent about race, but has whiteness throughout it. And its dominance has prevented a more complex history of modernism from being told. Now, in the conclusion of my book, I bring in the work of the contemporary multimedia artist, Ilana Harris Babu, whose, arti whose artistic practice interrogates many different kinds of current self-help culture. I really admire her videos and sculptures that engage with the world of interior design and that poke at its persistent codes of whiteness. She shows that this attitude among design historians to privilege a white history persists through the contemporary furniture retail world in videos like these two that we're seeing some stills from on the screen. So Reparations Hardware, which I'm representing on the left-hand side of the screen, is a satire of a promotional video that might announce a new line of furniture where a company might tout its reclamation of quote-unquote old wood Harris Babu draws our attention to the unpaid enslaved labor that may have originally worked the wood and which is now erased in a safely glamorized contemporary commodity. In Red Sourcebook, she illuminates the racialized language that pervades the annual product catalog for restoration hardware with copy that includes things like, we curate the very best people and collages it against images of her own hand drawing red lines randomly across the catalog pages, as randomly as the FHA assessors once drew red lines through the neighborhoods of our cities. Harris's critique of the modern furniture industry today pushes against the dominance of the white history of modernism. And what I hope my book does is to both demonstrate the specificity of what that white history of modernism looked like in the middle years of the 20th century, and also to return to focus the counter narrative of black consumers of mid-century modernism. It is undoubtedly one of many counter narratives of mid-century modernism that I hope we will recover in the coming years. And I will leave it there um, to, uh, hopefully open it up for a conversation with Sarah. Sorry, I was having trouble getting my video to turn on. <laughs> All of us are feeling the Zoomness, I think, of today. Um, Christina, thank you for that um, wonderful talk about your book. Much like you said in the beginning of your talk, this your book for me kind of pulled back the veil a bit more of really being able to recognize 
that kind of white default that is used in advertising and design that as a white person, I didn't necessarily always see. And so it was really wonderful to, to really be able to have that more pointed out and to look at these things a lot more critically. So again, and it was the, the archival images for it to illustrate it were just stunning. I love, love an archival image and the collection from it was, was wonderful. Um, I know this is the time for people to start putting questions in the Q and A and I'll start answering those. Um, but I can kick off with a question I had is at the very end of the book in your epilogue, you talk about how mid-century modernism is almost an echoing of colonial revival in some of the ways that it whitewashes this history. And I know you, you touched on it quickly, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about that because it claims of it mid-century modern claims that it's separating itself from historic reference mm. in a way and being this mm. new thing that has that is without reference but in so many of the things like the trappings of so many glasses versus so much cutlery on a table how those mm. things are those references are there but in different ways and I'd love to hear you talk about that a little bit more yeah yeah well so um yeah so that's one of the quips that I like to make uh, a little, I mean, just having to do with the um, fascination with mid-century modernism right now and the way that it, it is kind of um, pervasive and almost endemic in, uh, you know, everything from Ikea to room and board to restoration hardware to like, you know, I mean, the, the, the general aesthetic is everywhere in our furniture landscape uh, and has been really for the last 25 years. Uh, and, you know, in the early part of the 20th century, from really sort of the 1890s through the 1950s or 60s, um, the major, the most dominant and most pervasive decorating trend was the colonial revival. <laughs> and now we've got this modernism that is um, this pervasive decorating trend. And I was, anyway, so I started thinking about like, what were the parallels? And so some of the parallels are these, you know, the colonial revival becomes really popular in the 19 teens and twenties um, when it is considered to be um, a correction to the excesses of the Victorian interiors of the late 19th century. Uh, and it's a real whitewashing of American history and a promoting of a particular type of uh, a particular sort of story of the American past that has exclusively white protagonists uh, and is part of this kind of reconstruction or, and writing of American history that comes around sort of be, around the centennial 1876 to and then the sesquicentennial in 1926. So there's a, a lot of sort of American history writing that is happening in those in, in the, those 50 years. So the colonial revival is all a part of that. And it's a very white centric history that gets written and the colonial revival as a furniture style becomes really a part of that. And it's, and it's, so it's a little bit revolutionary because it's not your parents' heavy Victorian interior. So it's, but it's also safe because it's rooted in the past. It's got some legitimacy and it's got this undercurrent of whiteness in it. Um, and it's simple. Um, and all of these are things that I think connect to mid-century modernism now, because um, there's a, a sense of the excesses of, in, of interiors in the 1970s and 80s. And, and, and so the revival of mid-century modernism in the late 90s and into the 2000s is definitely a sort of a corrective against the excesses of the, 70, the interiors of the late 60s, 70s, and 80s. So it's a corrective to that. Um, it also has um, a sense of the legitimacy of a historical past. So it's actually, it's not actually new because it is a reference to the history of the mid-century, the supposed good, you know, morning in America years of mm -hmm. the middle decades of the 20th century. And also, it, I, I do think that the way it gets promoted has these undercurrents of whiteness uh, and that and and that that is that's a that's a very dangerous part of the rhetoric around mid-century modernism uh, and it's valuable to see that in fact 
mid-century modernism was a much more diverse and, and, and had many more um, connotations and ways of being used and embraced and, and, and loved and consumed when it was new. And I think that that's valuable for consumers to think about now um, and, and also for ways that it might be marketed today. Mm -hmm. That it has a much more multifaceted history than we're kind of simplifying and distilling down to as this simple time of, you know, as you said, it's much, it was much more, um, I hate to say it again, multifaceted, but there is much more layered and it was much more complex than what the last 20 years with Mad Men and some of these other influx yes. of this resurgence of it kind of has led us to feel. Yes, 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 exactly. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah. Well, we have some few questions coming in. Um, Charles asks, who did the, phot the photographs in Ebony's advertisements? Um, mm, that is a really good question. Um, I know who the, the I know who some of the photographers were for their editorial work. I do not know who the photographers were for their for the advertisements. Um, okay. So that's um, that's work to um, figure out. That that's work to figure out. Um, okay. So yes. Um, and... so I'm sorry, I can't answer that more. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I, I will, I will expand a little bit and just say that um, the history of how advertising, the advertising agencies and the partnership of advertising to advertising agencies and companies being advertised in Ebony Magazine and the actual publisher, that whole history is a fascinating and complex one. And there's a movement over the course of the late 1940s and early 1950s to bring greater representation uh, of models into the ads, which is something that I do document and address in my book, uh, but also to uh, many companies, either agencies or um, actual, um, pr you know, uh, actual product, you know, uh, companies that are making products to sell, um, they are bringing in people of color to represent the black market and wanting to um, figure out uh, with an idea that 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 having represent representatives from the black community will be better able to develop marketing that will be successful for the black community. Um, and it's a, a whole rhetoric around sort of the expertise of marketing uh, a whole, and there develops a whole sort of professional network of black marketing um, ex executives and advertising and, and marketing um, professionals that develops over the course of the 1950s. So definitely some of those advertisements are coming out of those networks, for sure. Mm -hmm. Do you think as people start doing more research, um, as your book might spur on as well, some of these photographers, these designers, these people who worked in advertisement, some of their names might be, there might be more information that comes out? I hope so. Yes, absolutely. Because there are things that you see in some of these ads and you think there's more of a story there. <laughs> <laughs> There's got to be. So, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And and some of the and some of the ads um, were done in partnership with, um, like some of the ads were done in partnership with the Johnson Publishing Company. And mm -hmm. I do think that more of the Ebony archives, not just the photo archives, but um, some of the, uh, I, I'm hoping that more of the business archives of the Ebony Publishing agency uh, of the of ebony publishing as like the sort of the in-house um records and correspondence and business papers will become available now that the archive has been acquired and um, disseminated across a couple of different institutions yeah it'd be great to have more access to that research as it like becomes yeah. digitized or have access to to really expand yes. on the story of who was making these why the decisions were made and have more insight that your book really digs in starts to dig into yeah yeah um we have a question from anthony anthony i'm sorry if i mispronounced it um 
They ask, what are your thoughts on the white and male dominance that continues through the fields of architecture, interior design, and furniture design? While advertising seems to have fallen in love with mixed race couples and families, the design industries still seem to remain exclusive to the global majority, brown and black, in favor of the global minority, white. Is this advertising slant just good capitalism? Yeah, I I mean, I I would say that um, I would say that there's a huge structural problem in the in this, uh, th there are many layers of structural problems, and I think I agree that there is um, I agree that it's an advertising slant, and that there's um, that there are many many things. I, I, I cannot speak to the design educational system in countries all across the globe, or I can't even really speak to it in any meaningful way outside of the United States. And I, I wasn't trained as a designer myself, so I really, I'm, I'm only speaking sort of from an outsider's position, even as in the U.S. But I do know that, you know, the, the structures that, um, the structures that are in place right now that need to be um, changed in terms of providing access through education and then opportunities once you get your foot in the door to a professional, you know, in a professional organization to then having the support and the coaching and mentoring all the way through in the development of a portfolio, all of this stuff. I mean, there are, there are layers and layers of corrective work that need to happen in design and architecture uh, in terms of race and gender, um, especially race, but in architecture, it's, you know, gender as well. Um, it's still a male dominated field. And um, I think that, uh, you know, th these are, these are big, these are, these are big structural issues that have to do with, you know, what our country is prepared to offer in terms of childcare and, you know, paid leave and, you know, all, you know, very large things. So I, I, I do agree that your, your question, Anthony raises um, an important discrepancy between an image and reality. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, it, it also acknowledges that the research and the, the acknowledgement of architects and designers of color and architects and designers that were women have largely been underreported historically. Yes. So there's a, a, a like, you know, an underlying sense that there haven't been when there have been some, there has been that work happening. It's just, it has obviously has not been as predominant as white men, but it, there have been designers of color, women designers and architects. It's just, like your book is pulling, that there was a lot more going on than what was being presented and is still sometimes presented to the public. And I think yep. that research really will help pull out more, but will, yeah, of course we need, you know, yes, there needs to be systematic changes to make sure that the fields are, do become more equal, but it's a lot, like you said, it's a big systematic change and it's a big question to look at and how we're going to take it on. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, yes. And I, and I guess to build maybe on a little bit of what you're saying there, Sarah, too, something that I think about a lot when um, my students ask, like, why is it important to try to find out something about a designer in the past about whom we can, we can find out just the smallest sliver. And I say, um, you know, if we can understand you know, like understanding the past is never a finished project. And so if we can understand the past differently, then it changes how we see our present and it changes what we can imagine for the future. And that is fundamentally, um, that's fundamentally what the work, that's fundamentally the value of doing this work is to sort mm -hmm. of, is to help us see the, see, see the past differently so that we can see the future differently. Yeah, I can agree more. Um, Marge asks, in Art Deco, for instance, an emerging modernism art movement, would you say women were sexualized more? 
Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> um, in a word, um, I, I do. I mean, uh, you know, um, it's interesting because um, I haven't necessarily in, engaged with Art Deco design. I, I have written about um, modernism in the 1920s and 30s uh, with regard to gender, but not quite in the way that your question is asking. But I do think that uh, women's bodies were sexualized and the motif of a of a nude female body um, as a part of an art deco design. I mean, to be stylized and then sort of put into two dimensions in, a, in an art deco pattern is absolutely, um, you know, is absolutely something that is, is done. And, um, and that leads me to think also just um, another thing that I talk about in the book a bit is how, um, is how in both Ebony and Life, there is a persistent association between women and modern design. And, mm -hmm. um, and so this is, and this is a, again, a sort of a, a connection between the sexualization of women and um, an objectification of women and asking to read or being encouraged to read design in certain ways and modern design in certain ways. And there is a tendency to um, present, you know, women, in especially in photo spreads, you know, as sort of a silhouette and to sort of see them as being all about their curves and the number of times that modern furniture is presented in that same kind of silhouetted, you know, and it's all about the celebration of the curves. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, I just, I, I feel like, I mean, I have a few photos in my book, but they were, you know, sort of colds from like many, many, many that I found where, you know, just this sort of the conflation of a woman's curves and the object's curves, you know, are all sort of the same thing. And so it's not the, it's not the same exact motif that in Art Deco where a woman's body is flattened and turned into a decorative motif, um, but it's the same concept where the, you know, the, the sexualized um, uh, visual enjoyment of a woman's body is, um, you know, is being presented to you and then the modern object is being presented in the exact same way. Mm -hmm. It becomes part of the design element that's most meant to be consumed visually, you know, it becomes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. of the, I think of the picture used where the naked woman is, I, you can't say sitting, that's not sitting in that chair of the, <laughs> was it the Eames womb chair? It's, you know, yeah. and how that it became part of the chair. You were seeing the chair and the woman in the same space and in the same plane, and they become they become part of the design together. And it's not a woman sitting in the chair. She is the chair is is that sensual object, and yes. she is just as sensual as the chair. So it is yes. yeah. very very much for you know the white male gaze. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um. We have a question that is, do you have any comment on the fairly recent use of the phrase brown furniture? Um, I don't, I'm not sure. I, I, I would want, I could, it would be great if this um, person could tell me a little bit more about what, um, about where that phrase appears because mm -hmm. I'm not sure quite what it refers to. I'm not, I'm not familiar with it. Hopefully they can either type in or be able to yeah. send a comment. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And then um, we have a question from Abigail. They ask, how have white students responded to your work, especially as it helps them see perhaps for the first time whiteness as the unmarked norm? Um, yeah, I think that, um, I think that students, I, I think for the most part, students are pretty, interested in this discussion. Uh, and I think that there's an increasing, I mean, it obviously it depends a little bit on what sort of, what sort of circles you're talking in, but I do think that students are increasingly interested in um, basically what I would call as a, a, you know, critical whiteness, a sort of an approach that is critical mm -hmm. whiteness. And I think that in the fields of art history and design history, this is, in, you know, this is an increasingly common and important question to be asking. And uh, I actually, this spring for the first time, assigned um, an essay 
um, in a class that's it's a class that is that is an interdisciplinary, you know, painting, design, photography, New York in the 1920s class. And I assigned an essay that is a, a critical whiteness approach to field of art and design history. And my students were very, very engaged with it. So I think it helps them to think a little bit more um, thoughtfully about about understanding how the canon gets constructed. You know, we can still mm -hmm. love these objects and think that they are important, you know, terrific works of design and creativity and engineering uh, and profoundly expressive and also be able to think about um, the ways that they operate, uh, in, you know, in what kind of power dynamics they operate and who, who they exclude and who they, um, and who they hide. Mm -hmm. uh, we did get a follow up from the what is brown furniture. It's a phrase thrown around a lot. And generally, we're talking pieces made out of solid dark wood, like walnut, teak, rosewood and mahogany. I think somebody were I think more people are asking that what is brown furniture? Yeah, well, so Again, I'm not um, familiar as much with this term. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking, um, uh, yeah, so I guess I mean I I've heard of I I I've I guess I I've heard of that phrase. Um, I was thinking of it as yeah. So I was thinking of it as a descriptor for um, for for dark wood for furniture that is made out of dark wood. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't I don't really have any I, I I don't know I don't have any particular comment on on that specifically. Okay. Um, another question is, have you considered the disconnect between architectural intent versus the evolution of advertisement directed to women in the home, beginning with the economics professionals when addressing home interiors that men will be financially supporting? Um, And um, I, that's, I, I haven't thought about this a lot. Um, I think that, um, I mean, there's, uh, so yeah, I, um, I'm trying to think about like, in terms of um, architectural intent. Um, I, so I think this person's maybe asking about um, the first chapter where I was talking about the um, in the decorating manuals um, and the uh, there's a lot in that chapter that is about sort of the hypothetical and the ideal rather than the necessarily the practice. So I wasn't. Um, I wasn't particularly um, thinking about, I wasn't thinking about the books as being a sort of um, templates for actual lived practice, but more like what kind of, um, what can we learn by what kind of ideal is being promoted? Uh, so, um, so there is, um, there's, so there's, there, so, so there's, so I, I want to sort of put that at the outset that I'm not assuming that any of these books are actually prescribing an actual lived practice. And I suppose that the disconnect that you might that that you do see, you know, it, between like intent and between actual lived practice. I'm not sure what kind of discontent disconnect you're you might be asking about, but um, you know, some of the disconnects that I saw are, for example, how George Nelson talks about um he talks about you know storage containers with more animation and agency than he does um the the woman of the house who actually does any work mm. <laughs> and so to me that's a disconnect like that he's more excited about how much storage he can create in a house than mm. he is about the actual people who live in the house. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So to me, that's a dis 
to me, that's a disconnect. more agency for an inanimate object in a container yes. than a than the yes. person who actually use, consume, yes. live in, yes. and put yeah. stuff in that container. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 They are not so stuff. Anyway. They are the people living within it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So, sorry, I'm just cleaning these out. I'm not as used to the Q and A's. Um, I think some questions might have been dropped into the chat as well. Someone, Marilyn asked, did first wave feminism have any direct effect on design? Did first wave feminism have any direct effect on design? Um, uh, and so by first wave feminism, you're talking about um, like the suffrage movement or um um i i mean i i read i guess what we'll, the the engagement or or the oh the feminine mystique um so i think of i mean so the feminine mystique is 1963 and so i do think that um the retrograde um approach to gender that is present in a lot of these designs is part and parcel of that mid-century culture that led to the feminine mystique so i'm not sure if that's exactly the answer that you're looking for Marilyn but that's I mean I do so I don't so 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 I do think it I, I do think the two are intertwined but I think that um, a lot of the designs from the 1950s are not particularly liberating for women and even though they claim to be uh, you know like Russell Wright is claiming that you know that he's designing these affordable uh, he, uh, you know affordable glassware um yet he's designing like 10 different shapes of glasses so that you need to have a pilsner glass and a wine glass and a water glass and a cocktail glass and a cordial and a glass, glass and a, and a, <laughs> you know kind of stuff like how many, how many glasses, glasses do you, how many glasses you do you lose need to your have? brain over the glasses yeah right right and, so I mean, even um, that ad where the woman is basically um it's like almost a ball and chain is the vacuum cleaner centering her on this access point around. Yeah. It's literally like an access point of which she can move and is contained around a space. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, her, that's her movement path is that yes. circle of the vacuum cleaners trunk. It's yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. The, um, I like that ball and chain <laughs> metaphor. So I do. So it's not that I think that um, feminism from the 1960s um, influences the designs. Rather, I would say that some of these designs contribute to the feminist movement is mm -hmm. through their through through their false promise of enlightenment and better living. Mm -hmm. All right. I think that answers Great. it. And yeah. I have. Do we have time yeah, for one more question more from me, Katie? Yeah, one more question. Yes, for sure. <laughs> so I would just love to touch on, I mean, we talk about how um, some of these are designed for the body and the ideal body. And I love how it's kind of referenced that some of these designs kind of reference almost the ghost of the, the shape of the person that was there before and the expectation of people that can fit into that and how that that ideal body ignores bodies of different sizes, bodies of different abilities, even, I mean, the Eames were creating splints for legs, yet it's ignored in some of their designs of how people of different sizes and bodily abilities can use their, use their, their products and the furnishings. And I was wondering if you found, if you encountered any in your research, just this, anything that looked a bit outside of that ideal that we're looking, that is so portrayed in these ads and advertisements and in the shape in use of the furniture. Mm. So it really does seem to completely ignore a greater demographic of, of bodily, of, of bodies, of people right, just as right, bodies. Right. That's a, um, that is a, a wonderful question. And I will say um, off the top of my head, an answer to that would be 
to say that I, I have, I can't think of a design specifically that speaks or that, that seems to directly um, embrace the idea of, of diversity of body sizes and abilities. But what I will say is that designs that have, you know, like the, the large, you know, a large couch with a cushion, you know, designs that have mm -hmm. cushions instead of being molded, mm -hmm. like those have a greater, like those are, those yeah. are more, those are more flexible ultimately. Mm -hmm. As opposed it's, to the coconut chair where even an able-bodied person has, you know, it's tough to get into. <laughs> yeah. Well, the coconut chair doesn't have any arms, so you have yeah. to like <laughs> back down into it. So if you're, you know, if you're doing hope. your yoga and you've got your good core strength, then sure, fine. But like, it's, you know, mm -hmm. but it's, it's yeah. not, it, it's, it, you know, it requires practice and agility to sit in. Mm -hmm. So um, it just was an interesting thought that came up as I was looking at those. It's just, again, it very much caters to a very ideal size yeah. and that. So it, it speaks yeah. again to the book, you know, that you that you wrote here with how design can sometimes ignore or negate people or experiences and use or or, or yeah. control it. So it's very just yeah. clicked off something in my head today when I was thinking about it too. So okay, that was it. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Sarah. And that was a very good question. So thank you for asking that. Um and thank you all for tuning in and for joining us. And Christina, thank you so much for sharing your work. Um, for anyone out there who has not yet read the book, I would encourage you to pick up a copy. It's a gorgeous book, lots of great illustrations that really help drive home the point. Um, and yeah, pick it up and read it. Let us know what you think. Um, Christina, thank you so much. Sarah, thank you so much. Um, we are going to be back to our normal book club next month, April 20th. We'll be talking about Leslie Curran's Gentrification is Inevitable and Other Lies. So pick that one up too and join us to talk about it or just join us in the Zoom to talk about gentrification and preservation and affordable housing and all sorts of other things. Um, so we will see you then. And if you liked this presentation so much that you want to share it with all your friends, I encourage you to do that. It'll be on our YouTube channel within the next couple of days. And you can also find it on our website. So thank you all for tuning in and we'll see you at another event sometime soon. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Thanks, thank you Preservation Thanks, League. Yes, thank you, Preservation League.